A Legacy of Love, Henriette Delille and the Sisters of the Holy Family is made possible by First NBC Bank, a community bank with 38 branches throughout the North Shore, South Shore, and Florida Panhandle. Founded on the principles of stability and soundness, building long-term banking relationships, and responsiveness to customer needs. First NBC Bank, strength, commitment, service. Member FDIC. Albert and Jolie Bernard. The Archdiocese of New Orleans. The Catholic Cultural Heritage Center, the Catholic Foundation of the Archdiocese of New Orleans, the Willwoods Community serving the Archdiocese of New Orleans with prayer and service since 1978, the Crusto, Jupiter, Salney, Prevost, and Wilson families, and by Mrs. Paul A. Nalty. It was Wednesday, October 15, 1851. A 39-year-old woman who had already traveled many hard roads in life took a short walk from her house on Bayou Road to St. Mary's Chapel in the French Quarter. There, she would profess her vows and become a nun. Just a few short blocks, an easy walk, but a significant step in a journey of faith. She would not travel far, but the mission she was on would someday reach across the world. There was a birthday party the year Henriette DeLille was born, but it was not for her. Louisiana was also born that year, in 1812, becoming the 18th state in the nation. That was the party. As for Henriette, few outside of her family even knew she had been born. There's no record of the day, just another baby, a descendant of slaves in the racially mixed city of New Orleans. Henriette DeLille's great-great-grandmother, Nanette, arrived in America on a slave ship in the early 1720s. She had children by her owner. Set free after her master's death, Nanette worked to buy freedom for her daughter and her daughter's children, which meant by the time Henriette arrived in this world, she was born free, a free person of color. Her uh, grandmother, her great-grandmother, had accumulated property after they were freed, a, a significant amount of property, real estate and slaves. And so she was descended from a group of people who had some property, had, they had educations, they were, um, they were significant members of the free colored population. When Henriette came along, the family was living in a Creole cottage on Burgundy Street in the French Quarter. She was the youngest of the children. All of their fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers were white. Her father was a Frenchman, Jean-Baptiste Sarpy. His name, Sarpy, is the last name, but his nom de plume or his French sort of um, nickname is Lille. So he always signs his name Jean-Baptiste Lille Sarpy. In relationships with free women of color, the children often could not take the last name of the white father, usually because he was married, as was the case for Henriette's father. So the children that he has can't take that Sarpy name. So they take a derivative of it, and they take a name that is of Lille, and in French that would be de Lille. Baptized and brought up in the Catholic Church, Henriette and her family, like most in the community, spoke French. Her early education likely came from the Ursuline nuns who were teaching and catechizing girls of all color in the French Quarter. When the Ursulines moved from their convent on charters to a new building outside of the Quarter, a French nun who'd been working with them, Sister St. Marthe Fontier, opened a school of her own to teach free girls of color, the St. Claude School. She would soon be joined by another French woman who had just arrived in America. Jean-Marie Alico had come to see her sister, who was an Ursuline nun, but before she even reached the shore, 
her life's direction changed. It's in our oral history that when she was getting off the boat, she fell into the water and a black man jumped in and rescued her. And she said she would use her life to help black people. Throughout her life, she was there for the sisters. She even taught at the St. Claude School. Henriette was among the students, as was her friend, Juliette Godin. At the time that she uh, was born and grew up, New Orleans was a very different city. It was mainly, what, Afro-Creole, French, Haitians. So it was a very multicultural, multiracial city. And it was very different from the rest of the country. With just under 30,000 people in 1820, half are white and half are people of color. Half of them are enslaved. It was a mix of diversity with free people of color owning property and businesses and slaves. And the women in the family followed the placide system. And the placide system was that these three women of color would live as mistresses to these wealthy white men. Sometimes they would first meet at ballrooms in the quarter where masked balls were held. Sometimes they would meet in church or just in daily life. Relationships developed. The women would live and be taken care of in the city while the man's legal wife and family lived in homes outside of town. New Orleans had a reputation of being wild and free, but even here, there were rules. It was illegal for whites to marry people of color. It didn't seem that any of the research that I've, that I've seen suggests that even the priests here thought that there was anything wrong with what they were doing. And so, so for them to form a liaison with a white man, which meant more affluence, more wealth, more stability in their lives and the lives of their children, meant that they had um, sort of a foot up, a, a step up in the community. When she was 15 years old, Henriette began a relationship with a man known now only as Monsieur Bacneau. It lasted just a few years. They had two sons. Both died before the age of two. By 1831 and the death of the second son, the priest writes uh, in, the, uh, in the book, of the, the sacramental book, that he buried the child gratis. And that means that she wouldn't have had the money to pay for the priest or for a funeral or for a burial plot. So it, at that point in time, there's some evidence that they were burying people in trenches along the edge of the wall. And so she would have had to uh, watch that happen and which would have been very tragic. Her children dead. Her family was poor again. Her Monsieur Bachno was gone. He disappeared from her life and from historical records as well. She sought the comfort of her friends, Juliette Godin and Josephine Charles, like-minded women who felt God was calling them to pour their lives into the lives of others. And by 1832, she had gone up to the Presbyter uh, to be confirmed. And in New Orleans in the 19th century, confirmation was only reserved for those people who were extremely devout. When she was about 24 years of age, she had this deep inner conversion, and she said that she, she loved God. She said she loved God, she believed in God, she hoped in Him, and she wanted to give her life to live and die for God. And she would do this in service to Him and in service to His people. It is her personal prayer, one she wrote in French in her own prayer book. I believe in God. I hope in God. I love. I want to live and die for God. Those words mark the beginning of a new mission for Henriette DeLille, a mission that would live on long after her own lifetime. Henriette DeLille and the two women who would join her in her mission for God really grew up together. And so as young women, when Henriette decided to take a totally different path in life, a far different one from any of the women in her family, she again found her friends by her side. Henriette and Juliet and Josephine could have chosen another path. Uh, they, they were free women of color. They were four generations removed from slavery. Uh, they were not poor. They had some degree of education. They could have chosen a life of plassage, like the women before them. 
Between them, they came up with an idea, a confraternity, a devout group of lay free women of color dedicated to serving God by serving others. They called themselves the Sisters of the Presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. DeLille wrote the rules and regulations herself. They would meet monthly, pay dues of 50 cents, and they would use their combined strength to help the weak. They would feed the hungry, care for the sick, comfort the dying. And in it all, they would teach others about God and the Catholic faith. It was 1836. And by that time, the laws in New Orleans had become very restrictive. Uh, free people of color weren't supposed to congregate. Um, they weren't supposed to do anything that would uh, threaten the social system. And that's exactly what she did, but she did it in such um, a quiet and dignified way that she literally did what she started out to do, which was ultimately to found a community of free women of color. Two prominent church leaders, Bishop Antoine Blanc and Father Etienne Roussillon, the chaplain at the St. Claude School, would discreetly support the women along the way, encourage, instruct, and involve them. Henriette DeLille's name is found many times in the sacramental records of the church as she acts as a witness to marriages and as a godmother to children who had no one to stand for them. She's working with Etienne Roussillon, who is going to become so important for the Sisters of the Holy Family and for how they developed. In 1836, Henriette is acting as a godmother for a child, and Etienne Roussillon is acting as the godfather, and he is baptizing that child. Um, so we see this, and it says it's happening at the St. Claude School, at the St. Claude Chapel. And the bishop, knowing that racial barriers, even laws and mores of the time, would threaten these women, wrote to Rome. He asked to affiliate DeLille's group with a sodality in Rome, to give them formal standing in the Catholic Church. In the request, Bishop Blanc called the small group of women in New Orleans, pious women, occupied in pious works. He did not mention anything about race or color. No. They did not know. Uh, Antoine Blanc, Bishop Blanc, did not write in his letter that they were free women of color. So when they, be, be, when they were awarded this, uh, or granted this affiliation, they were just simply known as women in New Orleans. In 1842, the women made a move, literally and figuratively. Henriette DeLille and Juliette Godin moved into a house together, a house they saw as a base for their ministry. From this moment on, they called themselves the Sisters of the Holy Family. They were a congregation. That's how they saw themselves. But that's not how everyone else saw it. For the first time, they were listed in the official Catholic Directory of the United States, described as an association of colored persons for the nursing of the sick and the destitute. They were recognized, but not as religious sisters. Almost immediately, church trustees brought them an elderly man to take care of, and although the sisters' mission was to care for elderly women, they could not turn him away. They had three elderly women already living in the convent with them, and then the officials, there was this elderly man, sick elderly man, and he asked them to take care of the man. Well, they couldn't live in the house with the man, so they actually moved out into another place and gave the house to him, and that's when we had the, found, the forming of our nursing facility. It seemed at the time there were no other options but plenty of needs. After the, old, the slaves were old and they couldn't really do any more, they just were cast aside. So at one time they had about three or four of them, you know, that they were taking care of. It was called the old folks homes at one time. Historically, it's known to be the oldest continuously existing nursing facility in the United States. The sisters were able to move to a house rented for them by their friend and supporter, Father Roussillon. It was on Bayou Road, just down the street from his new French-speaking church, St. Augustine. The church reflected the makeup of the streets of New Orleans. There were the blacks, the whites, and the slaves uh, worshipped at St. Augustine. You know, they have those, those little side pews, and the free people of color bought those pews and gave those to the slaves so that they could worship in there. And then, of course, one side, I think, was for white and one side for the blacks, but 
they worship together. St. Augustine becomes very important in Ariette's life because that's where she begins to minister um, and where she really starts doing tremendous work, working with both African-American children, the enslaved, the free people of color. Outside of church, the streets could be unforgiving, and there was no shortage of work for the fledgling sisters of the Holy Family. There were now four of them, but they were spending all of their time and what little money they had caring for the sick and educating young girls. DeLille received a small inheritance when her mother died, $1,200. She used that and borrowed a bit more from her friend Jean-Marie Alico to buy the rented house they were living in. Then she turned it into a convent with classrooms and a chapel. By the time they were living in the house on Bayou Road, the one that Henriette DeLille bought and made into a convent, they were not only taking in the elderly and, and caring for the poor, taking things to the poor, but they were also educating girls. They began to take in orphans and they had catechetical lessons. For the few number that there were, they were extremely busy, productive women. In those days, uh, that was really uncharacteristic for women to do that. You know, women didn't have that kind of authority and, and power, and she sure, and certainly didn't have it. And, uh, but she believed in what she was about, and she believed in God, and. It was uh, to God be the glory, and that's what she did. At the time, it was against the law to teach enslaved children, but the sisters had classes for them anyway. Catechism classes in the evening, after the day classes for free girls of color and women desperate for education. One other apparent inheritance Henriette received, a slave named Betsy. She was given to her, and it seems as if she, at the time, when she could have emancipated her, there were laws in Louisiana that said if a slave was freed, she'd have to leave the state. And then if, if you freed her and she stayed there, you'd have to pay, you had to pay a thousand dollar bond or something. Eventually, manumission laws, those governing the freeing of slaves, became so restrictive it made the practice almost impossible. So Betsy stayed with the sisters, Henriette freed her in her own will. Soon, the three friends were ready to take a step that was almost unheard of at the time. These free women of color wanted to take their vows. They wanted to officially become nuns, but they were not white and no other congregation would take them, even as novices, either because of outright racism or because of the fear of losing outside support for their own religious community. She could not become a novice in the city of New Orleans. There were many, many, many convents of nuns in New Orleans by the 1850s, but they were not going to allow a free woman of color in. She was a, she was a well-known free woman of color from a well-known family, so there was no way she was going to pass into a white community. While no official records exist, it is believed the bishop sent her to the Religious of the Sacred Heart in Convent, Louisiana, there, they took her in as a pantry girl. It gave them the socially acceptable cover to secretly train her in religious life. And so, on that Wednesday, October 15th of 1851, Henriette took a six-block walk to St. Mary's Church. She went to the Archbishop's Chapel, which is now St. Mary's Church, uh, that is attached to the old Ursuline Convent. She went there because Roussillon and Bl Antoine Blanc lived there, and they would have been there. So she would have walked from her house by herself and gone into the chapel and taken her vow, her simple vows, in front of these two men. Private vows promising poverty, chastity, and obedience. There was no ceremony, no tradition that she was allowed to follow. For other religious white sisters, they would dress as a bride, take their vows, and then exchange their gown for a habit. The tradition is that when you make your first profession, you receive the habit, you receive a veil, and you receive a crucifix. She was not allowed to do that, so she wore the garb of a day. And in place of a crucifix, what she did was she took a rosary and she put that over her head and hung that around her neck.
She had been wearing a blue percale dress as a religious laywoman, and then after her vows, she changed to a black dress with a white collar and white sleeves and a little cap on her head and wore a rosary around her neck, which is the photograph that we see of her now, is that was after she took her vows, but no, she was not allowed to take a habit. The priest or the bishop did not want them to be pretentious, and in addition to that, it would make the other white religious upset if they looked too much like them. Because they were kind of white themselves, you know, so I guess it made a difference. So she proceeded to, to look like a religious laywoman, but in her mind and in the mind of Roussillon and Blanc, she was a religious sister. I think uh, she stood as a, a, a true witness of what it means to serve God, and in serving God you do what was necessary. And you didn't worry about all those little things that, uh, uh, and obstacles that people put in your way. You know, you dealt with them, but you moved on. In honor of Teresa of Avila, she took the religious name of Mary Teresa. But no one really called her that. The elderly and the children she took care of knew her simply as Mother Henriette. Soon after her profession, she went to a photographer in the French Quarter and had her picture taken. This two inch by three and a half inch picture is the only known photograph of DeLille. A year later, Juliette Godin and Josephine Charles took their own vows, all throwing themselves into service, teaching, nursing, feeding stomachs and souls, giving away even the charity given to them. But they shared this with those who had less. Uh, it wasn't kept for themselves. You know, old shoes, uh, old coats that were uh, tattered and torn, but um, I think um, it must have been a very, very difficult time. In June of 1853, Charity Hospital noted a few cases of yellow fever. In just a couple of weeks, dozens, and soon many times that, were dying each day. The city was in the grip of an epidemic. Classes were canceled, but soon sick children and orphans replaced students in their small school, and the sisters took turns caring for the sick and dying in nearby homes. At the time, no one knew the cause of the disease or how it spread, and in desperate attempts to stop the raging epidemic, the city experimented with burning tar to purify the air. And at one point, somebody thought, firing cannons throughout the city might help. That summer, of the 154,000 people in the city, nearly 8,000 died of the fever. And there would be other summers with other epidemics to follow. An historical account written by one of the sisters at the end of the 19th century gives a glimpse into their daily lives. Many a night did our dear sisters after working all day pray that some dear friend would send them a few spoonfuls of sugar. It is not necessary to say a word about their clothing, for it was more like Joseph's coat that was of many colors and pieces, darned until darn was not the word. Their numbers remained small in those early years, just a handful of sisters, starved, stressed, and struggling, still counting it a blessing to suffer in service to God. Things were about to get worse as dark days of war and the shadow of death closed in on them. In April of 1861, issues of states' rights and slavery led to a divided nation, and that led to war. Much of the South, including Louisiana, had seceded from the Union, and the following year, Union forces were upon New Orleans. They seized the city, and while New Orleans was spared the destruction seen in other Confederate cities, the economy was devastated, and the numbers of poor and hungry grew. The sisters, 12 of them now, did their best. They completely gave up what they had to care for the poor. They begged for a living. They took handouts. They were given coal. They were given, they, they drank sugar water for supper when they went hungry. They prayed for the things that they needed so that they could actually sustain themselves because they devoted everything to those who were more needy than they were. 
In April 1862, the same month Union troops occupied New Orleans, Henriette DeLille went to the cemetery and bought a used tomb. She even hired someone to do the concrete work. Before the end of the year, Henriette became deathly ill. Tuberculosis was suspected. A few days before her death, the butcher came in and did surgery on her, probably taking out a lung. And it was just a few days later that she died. So it is, it is very clear that she suffered greatly before she died. That would have been a terrible, painful existence for the, the years before she died and the, certainly the months before she died. On Monday, November 17th, 1862, Honoriette DeLille took her last breath. She died at 50 years of age. Um, and history tells us that from she was worn out from all the work that she had done, you know, from day in and day out and not really eating properly, t seeing that other people had food before she had food and taking care of the sick and the elderly. She also uh, did end up with tuberculosis and she died from that. An obituary, likely written by her friend and mentor, Father Etienne Roussillon, spoke of her humble spirit and total dedication. Last Monday, there died one of those women whose obscure and retired life has nothing remarkable in the eyes of the world, but is full of merit before God. Miss Henriette de Lille had for long years consecrated herself totally to God without reservation, to the instruction of the ignorant and principally to the slave. In there, it says that here's a, a young woman who did more than big philanthropists, you know, who have a lot of money. And you could tell by the people who were there how much they loved her. And the last line said, for the love of Jesus Christ, she made herself the humble servant of slaves. Referred to as Miss and a poor maid, Nowhere in the obituary was it mentioned that she was a religious sister and no mention of her race. This woman, who quietly struggled for the poor, the sick and the elderly, all in the service of God, was never permitted to wear a habit. Mass was held at St. Augustine Church. The cost of the simple funeral, $31.75, including $20 for the coffin and hearse, and a dollar and a quarter for five beeswax candles. She was buried in her newly purchased tomb in St. Louis Cemetery Number 2. When Henriette died and the Union troops were in town and everything was so completely chaotic, most of the women, seven of the women out of 12, left the, the convent. Their parents did not want them to stay in. Without Henriette's charism, they felt like the convent wouldn't continue. Five women remained doing the work of many more as the war and the hardships of living in a blockaded city continued. And then after the war ended, new challenges. The end of slavery did nothing to end racism or poverty or lack of education. Freed slaves needed to find a place to go. Some didn't understand. They thought being free meant they didn't have to work anymore. The sisters found needs everywhere they turned. And even as the needs increased, there was trouble from within. Archbishop Odan asked the new mother superior, Juliette Godin, to take a former slave into their community. She was the housekeeper, a slave housekeeper to the bishop or one of the directors. And they wanted, he, wanted to know, he wanted her to be able to enter the Sisters of the Holy Family. But Juliette said no, she didn't want us to be domestic. She wanted them to keep doing like they had always, you know, always done, you know, preach the gospel and help the poor and not be in the kitchen. Josephine Charles agreed to take in the new novice. It caused a split in the house and Josephine and two other sisters moved out. They were difficult years as the sisters worked out how to go on without the driving force of Mother Henriette but they kept working, starting a new school, one that would eventually be named St. Mary's. They opened an orphan asylum for girls, and they were asked to really step out in faith, out of the city. A priest asked them to open a school in Opelousas for the neglected African-American children in his parish. 
At that time, it was a four-day journey by boat and train just to get there. But a house was waiting for them, and within a week, they had St. Joseph's School up and running. Things started to look different for the sisters in 1872. For the first time, 10 years after Henriette DeLille's death, they were finally allowed to wear a habit, one designed by Josephine Charles. In the years right after the Civil War, constitutional amendments abolished slavery, awarded citizenship, and gave voting rights to African-American men. But racism found a way around those guarantees. And for many, including the sisters, the daily fight against hunger and poverty also included facing prejudice. We had a very hard time, for we had many enemies who wanted to degrade our dear little community, as poor as we were. During that time, we were persecuted by some sisters in this city. They tried all that they could to make us take off our habits. That was after 45 or 50 years that we had worked and suffered to have a religious habit. They ignored the taunts, the racism, even superstitions. When the old Orleans ballroom went up for sale, they didn't see the past, they saw the future and an opportunity to convert. Nobody wanted to touch it because it was tainted as a quadrant ballroom. So it had just sat there for, a, for decades. And so Mother Josephine decided, well, this is a, a fabulous deal. It's a business deal. We need this big house. We're going to grow. We're going to have our school. We're going to have our nursing home. We're going to have everything here. And so she signed a contract to buy the building. Well, there was controversy about that. How do the sisters buy a ballroom that had been used for dance and debauchery and all the different types of things that were associated with balls, Mardi Gras, quadroon balls, all, all the different, you know, the partying, the partying of New Orleans. And here they are buying a party house. And the archbishop told, called her in when he found out and told her to stop, that she needed to go tell the man she had signed the contract with that she wasn't going to sign, that she was going to break the contract, that she couldn't buy the building. And she told the archbishop, okay, but she didn't tell that to the man. She continued with the contract. And the sisters moved in to the Quadrant Ballroom, which was then the, the convent of the Sisters of the Holy Family in 1881. It would cost them $21,000, but they were determined. They took in laundry and student boarders, and they begged. They organized their begging. They would have one sister go to the market with an orphan and go to the market, and they would beg for produce and chickens or whatever they needed, sugar. They would go to the courthouse where people were working, and they would stand outside and they would on Friday afternoons, and they would beg for a little money out of their paychecks. And they would hold their hands out and say, this sister went, that's an oral history, you know, and she put her hand out and she was asking for help. They were used to them coming. And this person spit in her hand. So she just took her handkerchief and cleaned out. She said, now that was for me. Could you give me something for the poor children? It helped feed the hungry in the orphanage, in the old folks home and on the streets and it helped pay the note. Some sisters even got permission to beg in cities up north, not as hard hit by the war and reconstruction. Cities like New York, Cincinnati, Chicago, and Boston. And in the meantime, the sisters cleaned up their new home on Orleans, turning it from the scandalous party house to a convent and more. Soon, many of their missions would be housed there, a school, an orphanage, a nursing home. Eventually, they bought the rest of the block, giving their school more room. The school renamed St. Mary's because of its proximity to St. Mary's Church in the quarter. With a new mother house, the sisters who had split after the war reunited, and their reputation for good works instilled a sense of charity in others. Some benefactors even put the sisters in their wills, leaving land, houses, and money. There are people leaving the sisters' property. And it, and it isn't just free people of color or people of color or um, wh white people. It's all people. And they see it as a mission um, and a good way to leave property for um, sisters that are doing such good work in the French Quarter. 
Philanthropist Tommy LaFon, a free person of color, was a school teacher turned real estate businessman. He helped both before and after his death. Tommy LaFon was a benefactor to the Sisters of the Holy Family. He, uh, he gave them property before his death, and then after his death, he willed them a significant amount of property that was investment property. It was um, housing that they could rent. It was, uh, it was things that they could actually make an income off of. The LaFon name and his legacy live on in the nursing facility on the Sisters' property today. As the turn of the century approached, the Sisters of the Holy Family saw their numbers and their missions growing and going beyond the city, beyond borders. They were expanding outside the country by the 1890s. They were ladies on the move. With their own numbers growing, the sisters were hearing and answering the call for help from outside of New Orleans, from outside of the state. People desperate for the kind of caring and educational support the sisters could offer. They're continuing to grow. So it isn't just something significant for New Orleans, it's something significant for the United States. They broaden even outside of that. They go to Belize, which is British Honduras now, but you know, it's, it's Belize where they start a mission there, which is called Stand Creek. When a group of sisters set sail for Belize, they may not have known it, but they were beginning a mission that would last over a hundred years. In Belize, they set up a school and a convent. They taught sewing and marketable skills to children and women and found new sisters willing to serve. They shared their faith and showed others how to follow in the footsteps of Christ. I think it was probably the call to mission, but in addition to that, it was the possibility of vocations, of expanding our mission and also making it possible for Belizean women who were of African descent to find maybe a calling as, as a sister of the Holy Family. And that did indeed happen. Back at home, the congregation was sending sisters to start schools and convents in several cities and states, saying yes first, figuring out how to pay for it all later. They were raising money by doing laundry and sewing. They made baby clothes, embroidered silks and tablecloths. They made the priest cassocks and did the washing for the clergy at the cathedral. And it was the sisters who created their own host department and lovingly turned dough into wafers to be used during mass. The sisters supplied altar bread for most churches in the city, as well as several parishes in Louisiana and Texas. In those years, money wasn't the only challenge. Prejudice and pushback from even fellow religious was disheartening. When asked to start a school in one particular community, the sisters went only to find there was no room for them in a house of white sisters. Other accommodations had been made. At one time, uh, when they went to Donaldsonville, they didn't have a house and then some of the sisters actually stayed in a barn with the animals living on the other side of the barn. But they took that and endured that because they wanted to service the people there in that parish. In fact, soon after they got their feet on the ground there, they turned an old barn nearby into classrooms. Wherever they went, they built, not just convents and schools, they helped build lives. They taught people to pray, they taught people to, to, to uh, to bring to God uh, their ills, their, their hopes, their dreams. Their, and, and because of that, they kept alive the, the, uh, a vision of hope uh, for, for others. Uh, they trusted God and they called people to do the same. Their energy and enthusiasm was contagious. More schools, more sisters. And in 1906, one of them, Mother Austin Jones, had a focus on the future. And it was looking a lot like a swamp, 123 acres of it in Gentilly. At the time, it was swamp land. But of course, people were saying, oh my goodness, I mean, you know, why is she buying swamp land? You know, what are they going to do with that? There was nothing back here, but nothing but swamp. She bought 123 acres at $10 an acre. Maybe they could farm there 
teach the orphan boys about agriculture, how some of their missions. She saw it as a good investment. In the meantime, running out of space at their boys' orphanage, the sisters built a new facility on Gentilly, the LaFon Home for Boys. The St. John Birchman's Girls' Home would follow years later. It seemed the sisters' mission to fulfill their mission was unstoppable. For some sisters, as soon as they received their habit, they were packing a bag and catching a train to go open a school somewhere. We had a school in Covington. We had one in Mandeville, elementary school. We expand. We were in Lafayette and Baton Rouge and Brobridge, my own home. We were in Florida. We were in Alabama. We were in Washington, D.C. We had several schools in California. And we were in Massachusetts. In the 1920s, new state regulations requiring certification for teachers became a major problem for the sisters. Back then, there was no place for them to go to college here, no place to take the classes, no way to get certified. As women of color, they were not able to find many schools that would take them to educate them. And so they really struggled for many, many decades to find places that would give them college educations. Everything they did was, they were confronted with racism. Everything they did. I mean, the idea that you can't get an education yourself and you're founding schools for girls, is extra, it's an extraordinary story. Not only were they women, they were women of color. They were also women who weren't about to give up. They asked Archbishop Shaw for help, and the Archdiocese brought in six Sisters of Charity of Seton Hill to come to New Orleans to educate the teaching Sisters of the Holy Family. When Xavier University, the first historically black Catholic college, opened in 1925, Sisters were able to take classes and earn degrees there as well. In 1932, their school, St. Mary's Academy, received state accreditation. From the chalk cliffs of Dover, Britain. World Famous War II was raging as the congregation noted their 100th anniversary. On November 21st, 1942, during a celebration of their history, the sisters and their friends gathered for Mass at St. Louis Cathedral. In the homily, the priest recognized works of the Sisters of the Holy Family. One of the hidden but rare jewels of the Catholic Church in America, its greatest greatness is unknown. Earth knows a little, God the rest. By the mid-1940s, there were 263 professed sisters, 22 novices, and one postulant. As their numbers grew, the sisters were running out of room in the French Quarter, and they were dreaming of building their own mother house, not converting another old building. That's when that swampland bought in 1906 came into play. Through donations and loans, the project was completed in 1955. They wanted it to be built in an E-shape to maximize light and airflow. Stained glass filtered light filled their new chapel. Soon, they would bring St. Mary's Academy out there with them, a new school building for the students with all of the advantages and advancements that came with it. They sold the Orleans Street property in the quarter. Their $21,000 purchase in the late 1800s had grown in value. The selling price was $675,000. The old mother house, which had once been a ballroom, would now be turned into a hotel, the Bourbon Orleans. Over the years, the sisters would gather more and more of their missions closer to the mother house. The 125th anniversary of the congregation highlighted not only the continuing work of the sisters, but the change in social climate in New Orleans. Part of the celebration in November of 1967 was held at a popular downtown hotel. One sister wrote, 25 years ago, such a gathering at the Roosevelt would have been impossible. Before the passing of the Civil Rights Bill in 1959, Members of the two races could not have met on such terms of friendship and equality at the Roosevelt or at any other first-class hotel in New Orleans. Desegregation of public schools in New Orleans was a long and rocky road. Hatred and anger filled hearts and minds and streets. It challenged the schools, divided lawmakers, and tested the courage of little girls. 
And while many families who could afford it sent their children to private schools, Archbishop Rummel was determined to desegregate the archdiocesan schools as well. The Sisters of the Holy Family opened their schools to all races and set up a teacher exchange program with White Sisters of Charity in Pennsylvania. For the sisters, throughout their history, the fight against racism was a quiet one. They would ignore the ignorance and help whoever they could. We look at disappointments as a challenge, as something that we just have to accept and just move on and rise above it and look at the final goal. Always keep our eyes on the goal, keep our eyes on Christ also and stick close to Him and he will always see us through. In their walk through the challenges, sometimes the disappointments were across town. Sometimes they were sitting right next to them. I was sitting in, at mass and there's a nun right next to him and I said, do you work here? She said, oh well, yes, Lord, I'm with the blacks. <laughs> I see you mean you don't like us. She said, yeah, I am. You know, it, it didn't really, hurt, except afterwards when I thought about it, I said, now here, she's working with them and they probably love her to death and everything. And she's, she's saying, you know, this is a trial for her. Throughout the years, they did not get caught up in how others treated them. They focused on how they treated others. In their ongoing efforts to pay expenses and raise money for missions, the sisters hatched a new idea. They would use part of their property as a poultry farm. The hatchery provided plenty of egg money for the congregation. They also sold turkeys. In the mid-60s, they decided to try a new kind of holiday fundraiser, a fruit cake drive. The sisters got together in the kitchen and whipped up cake after cake. It was so popular, they made it a holiday tradition, and they sold and sent cakes around the United States, even to Europe and the Far East. In the mid-20th century, new government social services and foster care programs led to a change in the care of orphans. The orphanages around the country were disappearing, and the sisters closed theirs as well. Then, seeing the need for child development and child care centers, the sisters stepped right in. In the 70s and 80s, as in many religious orders, their numbers started to drop off. Fewer and fewer women wanted to join a congregation. Eventually, they had to pull back on some of their missions, but they were still getting requests for help, even from far away. A bishop in Nigeria wanted them to help set up and train a new order of religious sisters there. I was ending a ministry in one place, and my superior posed the question, would I go? And I said yes, because that's what we're used to doing, <laughs> saying yes. <laughs> so uh, in the tradition of our order and the tradition of religious life, I did go. She stayed 18 years. They've been blessed by visits with saints. One in Rome, another made a visit to see them. Mother Teresa visited the Sisters of the Holy Family. And I can only imagine, I mean, she's now a saint, Saint Teresa, Saint Mother Teresa, um, was here. And when she came into Louisiana, she stayed with them. She stayed with them overnight, and um, she was there to celebrate Mass with them. They put a small plaque on the door of the room where she spent the night. They hope one day to see their founder's name listed among the saints in the Catholic Church. The canonization process began in 1988. And the bishop asked Mother Rose, who was the superior at that time, why is it that we didn't do that before? And I think her question was, who would have been interested in a black woman who founded a black community before this time? And you know, that's true. Archbishop Hannon started things in motion and the cause was accepted by the Congregation of Saints in Rome. Henriette de Lille was then called a servant of God. And after that congregation of 15 people, seven historians and nine theologians reviewed her history and biography, she received a new title. He established that Henriette had practiced uh, heroic virtue. 
and she could be called venerable. So that was 2010 that she was made venerable. For beatification, to be called blessed, the church must be convinced that a miracle occurred because of her intervention in heaven, and another miracle for the designation of saint. The sisters wait. When Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, the sisters were overcome with grief. It wasn't the damage to all of their facilities, it was the tragedy that came after the storm. At the LaFon Nursing Home, where many patients were too fragile to evacuate ahead of the hurricane, the power was out, the heat oppressive, no help was coming. The sisters were there taking care of them, there were family there taking care of them, but it became so hot and they couldn't uh, they couldn't flag down any help, they tried. So finally, uh, one of the workers that was here went out into the parking lot and they heard, saw their phone peep with some life and they called a family member in Atlanta who came with a boat and they began to get people out. But by the time help arrived, 22 residents had died. The physical recovery, the buildings and structures took years. Some missions would not reopen. Eight feet of water had swamped the area. Many of the artifacts and original documents from the founders destroyed. But their mission to serve the poor and the sick and the elderly continued. Their mission to educate went on. They still hear the call. The same call Henriette DeLille heard so many lifetimes ago. In 2006, Henriette de Lille became part of the country's oldest Catholic cathedral in continual use. In order to bring more recognition to her, there is a prayer room in the St. Louis Cathedral. It used to be the baptistry. It was, it was in the back of the church. And through some very generous donations, two beautiful stained glass windows were put in that depict Henriette. It shows her as a godmother to a free infant or enslaved uh, child of color. It shows her at the baptismal font that has been in New Orleans and the cathedral since the French period. And the other window is a depiction of her with school children and the elderly gathered around her. And we hope that eventually, after she's canonized, it will be her chapel. Archbishop Gregory Amon added her name to the family prayer said in churches throughout the diocese. Today, the sisters hold up the past while reaching for the future. Although their population is down and their ages are up, they're still on the go. Still teaching in schools, caring for children, taking care of the elderly, nursing the sick. They serve in retirement communities and work in prison ministry. From their front door, they give away food and provide necessities for the needy. And it's a special time of celebrating when they get to welcome new novices and sisters. St. Mary's Academy, the girls' school they started in the French Quarter long ago in 1867, is a living legacy. The thousands of girls who've been nurtured and fed mentally, physically, and spiritually through the years have given back to their community and the world. Located near the Sisters of the Holy Family Mother House, St. Mary's, rebuilt after Katrina, is a thriving, growing school filled with young women who are taught critical thinking and Christian values. It is still a mission of love. They live up to their name. I, I believe that's what uh, it means to be family, when you draw people into your life. You know, they become brothers and sisters to you. And the sisters, I, I believe, are that way. And because of that witness, I think that's what keeps them alive today. I mean, they. They draw others into the family. We're all family. And, uh, and really, that's a beautiful testimony in itself. These women are extraordinary women. They have all dedicated the, their entire lives to helping the poor, to educating children, to caring for the elderly. They, they have always followed in the steps of Henriette, Juliet, and Josephine. They're continuing the ministry that was started for free and enslaved women and children. Honoring the past, 
They don't live in it. They live in this day, and they look forward to all of the other days God has for them, and they're hopeful that others will follow. I am not worried about that. I live in hope and in, uh, and in love, and I, and I just believe that God will care for us, and we just have to uh, live each day and each moment in His love and wait on Him like we did in the beginning. Well, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll get two or three or four and they'll start all over again like Aria, Juliet, and Josephine. I would love that, you know, that might be a little, maybe you can, things happen, you know, things happen. Wherever the poor is, we need to find ourselves where the poor is so that we can help them. Wherever the person who is neglected, that we should be there to assist them. Our mission is that we are here to service the people, the people that are in most need of us, and we'll be here. And so they continue on this day to help, to heal, to honor their calling as Sisters of the Holy Family. A Legacy of Love, Henriette Delisle and the Sisters of the Holy Family is made possible by First NBC Bank, a community bank with 38 branches throughout the North Shore, South Shore, and Florida Panhandle. Founded on the principles of stability and soundness, building long-term banking relationships, and responsiveness to customer needs. First NBC Bank, strength, commitment, service. Member FDIC. Albert and Jolie Bernard, the Archdiocese of New Orleans, the Catholic Cultural Heritage Center, the Catholic Foundation of the Archdiocese of New Orleans, the Willwoods Community serving the Archdiocese of New Orleans with prayer and service since 1978, the Crusto, Jupiter, Salney, Prevost, and Wilson families, and by Mrs. Paul A. Nalty. To order a DVD copy of A Legacy of Love, Henriette Delisle and the Sisters of the Holy Family, call 504-830-3717 or visit WLAE.com.